We're there in uh, Second Peter chapter number one. Second Peter chapter number one. And I want you to just have a look back at um, verse number five. Look at verse number five of Second Peter. Actually, yes, start in verse number five of Second Peter one. Verse number five. It says, "And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity." For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice what it says there, verse number 5. It says that we should be diligent to add to our faith. So this is, this is basically, um, the, the title of the sermon tonight is Adding to Your Faith. And we're going to be talking about um, something that the Bible says that we should give all diligence. We should be diligent in adding to our faith. You know, and, and so if you're diligent in something, doesn't that imply that you have to put effort into it? If you say, look, this person's really diligent, would you think that means, oh, okay, they don't, they don't really put any effort in at all? Or would you say that means that they put a lot of effort in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if they're diligent, they put a lot of effort in. I mean, it's, diligence, it's kind of like this, the opposite of being slack, being lazy. Like some, on one hand, you could be really diligent, hard working. The other hand, you could be slack and you could be lazy. Okay? And the thing is, depending on if you're diligent or whether you're lazy, you'll get different results. Does that, do you sort of, that sort of make sense? And I mean, because you can get, it's not, that, it's not that someone is necessarily going to be diligent in every single thing they do, and someone else is going to be lazy in every single thing they do. You'll often find people will be a combination. They might be diligent at some things, and they might be really lazy at other things. You know, that, 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 that can often happen. But having said that also, there can, and, and we'll probably get into it in a minute, you'll actually find there can be a tendency when you are lazy in something, it'll tend to spread to other areas. But likewise, when you're diligent in something, that will also spread to other areas. So, as I said, the title of the sermon is Adding to Your Faith. Now, just to make it really clear, to underline this, we're not talking about salvation in any way, shape, or form. Okay? If we're talking about adding to our faith, because you see, um, some people have this idea, they say, well, yeah, you need to have faith and you need to have works. You ever heard people talk about that? But have faith and have works. Well, this is talking about adding to your faith, but it doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. And then it says, not of works, lest any man should boast. So being saved with faith and works, how does that fit in? Because it says we're saved by faith, not works. Okay, so um, Romans, Romans, actually have a look at Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1 says, Therefore... Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore being justified by faith and works, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what it says? No. Therefore being justified by faith. So we're justified just by faith. Okay, so if someone says that you've got to add works to your faith in order to be saved, that's a different gospel. That's different from the gospel that's in the Bible. Okay? And um, I mean, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For by grace you saved through faith that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, sorry, that's Ephesians, not of works as anyone should boast. Romans chapter 6, excuse me, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but it also says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. So salvation is a gift. That means you don't have to work to get it. Because if, you, if someone gives you a gift, do you have to work for that? Or is it free? It's free, obviously, okay? Um, in fact, it says in Romans 11, verse 6, it says, just contrasting it, it says, and if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So it's either works or it's grace. It's either a gift or it's work. You know, you don't work for a gift. If you work for something, then it's not a gift. It's something you're earning. It's something that's being paid for. Um, have a look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 16. And this also just goes backwards and forwards between these two things. It says in Galatians 2.16, it says, Knowing the man is not justified by the works of the law, not by works, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that's another word, believe is another word for faith, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Um, Romans chapter 3 verse 28 says, Therefore we conclude the man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So it's not the deeds, it's not the works, it's just faith. But having said that, actually 
Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I quoted this before. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, says, For by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God. We saw that before, Ephesians 2, 8. Verse 9 says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. But then let's keep reading. Let's look at verse number 10. Ephesians 2, 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So what, what this is saying, God's saying that we're saved by faith, but he wants us to do works. There are works that he wants us to walk in them. Um, have a look at Titus chapter number 3. Titus chapter number 3, this is, this is very similar actually. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5. Titus 3, 5. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done. So is it by works of righteousness which we have done? No, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Verse 7, that being justified by his grace, once again talking about it's, it's a gift, it's not something earned, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. But then look at verse number 8. It says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm... How often? Constantly. Mm -hmm. That they which have believed in God, those which are saved, might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So that's saying the same thing. Just like in Ephesians, it's free, it's received by grace, by faith, but God wants us to work. Exactly the same thing here. It's not by works we've done, it's just, you know, by his mercy we're saved, but he wants us to work. Everyone understand that? We're saved completely by faith, but he wants us, he still wants us to do good works, okay? And why does he say? He says, because these things are good and profitable unto men. And so we understand that it's profitable. It helps people when we do work, okay? It helps us in our own lives, not with regards to salvation, but it does help other people because other people could get saved because of the work that we do. For example, if we go out and preach the gospel to people, someone could get saved. Well, if we don't, if we just say, well, I'm not going to work, I'm just going to sit at home, I'm just going to watch the telly, put my feet up. Is anyone going to get saved from you doing that? No, they're not. But he says, these things are good and profitable unto men. Okay, so um, turn back to Second Peter again. Turn back to Second Peter. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter number one. Second Peter chapter number one. Second Peter chapter number one. So what is it that we should add to our faith? This is what we're going to have a look at. What, what is it we should be adding to our faith? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says, And beside this, giving all diligence, being diligent about it, add to your faith. So as, as we go through these qualities, we're going to turn to a number of different verses. And you'll actually notice there's going to be quite a bit of crossover between them. Okay, It's not that you add one quality, and then once you've got it, you move on and get the next one, and you just keep doing that until you're finished. Basically, we're never going to finish in this life because there's always room to improve. There's always room to get better. That's why the Christian life is described as one of growth. It's just it's something that we should be continually growing. You know, Ideally, we should be grow looking to grow in each of these areas, each of these qualities at the same time. And as we grow in one area, you, it'll help you grow in another area. And as you help grow in that one, it'll help you grow in another area. It's sort of a, it's like a vicious, not a vicious circle, uh, like a gracious circle or a gracious cycle is probably what you describe it as. This leads to good things. Because everyone's heard of a vicious circle. It's like where something bad happens which leads to something else, which is, and it's like a downward spiral. Well, this is like an upward spiral, okay? Um, so let's look at the first one. It says, and add to your faith virtue. Virtue. Now, virtue, I looked it up in the dictionary. According to the dictionary, it describes virtue as moral excellence. Um, goodness, righteousness, conforming one's life and conduct to moral and ethical principles. Uprightness, chastity, virginity, a good or admirable quality or property. So there's lots of different definitions there. But basically, if something's virtuous, this is something that's good. It's something that's desirable, you know, um, Actually, have a look. Um, turn to Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs chapter number. Proverbs chapter number twelve. Proverbs chapter number twelve. Actually, just turn to Proverbs thirty-one. That might be easier. Turn to Proverbs chapter thirty-one. And while you do, I'll read to you from Proverbs twelve. Proverbs twelve verse four says, "A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness 
in his bones. Saying a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. It's a good, it's a good thing. A virtuous woman is a good thing. But someone who's, that maketh ashamed is as rottenness as his bones. So you want to be really careful when you're choosing a wife. You want to be ch- careful to choose someone who's virtuous. Okay? Because it's going to be a crown. But you don't want to have someone that's going to make you ashamed because it's like rottenness in his bones. That doesn't sound good. It says in Proverbs 11.22, as a jewel of... Because a lot of people, when they're thinking about a wife, what, they look, what do they look for? They think, well, who's, who's physically attractive? That's what they look for first. But it says in Proverbs 11.22, as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout. So think of like a pig. Okay, a pig and it's got some sort of <laughs> bit of jewellery in its nose. It says, as a, as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman, that's a woman that's attractive, which is without discretion. That's the woman, she's, she's lacking in virtue. Okay? Um, Proverbs chapter 31, you're in Proverbs chapter 31, look at verse number 10. Proverbs chapter 31 and verse number 10. Proverbs 31, 10. It says, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. A virtuous woman, a woman that's got virtue, is very valuable. Verse 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. So a virtuous woman is someone who's trustworthy. She's a trustworthy woman. Um, Verse number 12, She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax, and worketh willingly with her hands. Well, notice this comes up over and again. What's she doing? She's actually, she's working. Okay? She's working. And that's something you might want to look for. When you're looking for a wife, you want to look for a woman who actually works. Now, I'm not saying that she's someone who goes out and works a job. What I'm saying is someone who works hard at whatever they do. You don't want to have a wife who is lazy. If you have a wife who is lazy, you're going to have a sad, a sad, sad life. Okay? She works willingly with her hands. Um, verse 14. She is like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand she planteth the vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth out, not out by night. So notice, she's getting up early and she's staying up late. She's working hard. She's not a lazy woman. She's not lying. She's not sleeping until all hours. She's not lazing in bed. She's working. Verse number 19, she layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor and needy. She, um, to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, that's handy in Dunedin, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. So so she's busy. She's busy. And notice, I'm talking about, in this chapter, it's talking about a virtuous woman. But the same thing applies the other way around. Like ladies looking for a husband, you don't want to have a lazy man. You do not want to be married to a lazy man because you're going to be, that's a, a bad thing. You're in for a very sad life if you're married to a lazy man. Um, Her husband, verse 23, Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honour are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. Look at this, verse 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. So what comes out of her mouth is a good thing. Okay, Pay attention to what comes out of the mouth. Of, of, of a woman, if you're thinking of marrying a woman or dating a woman or something, what comes out of her mouth? Okay? Want to talk about that other one? We looked back there, it talked about someone, a woman, a fair woman, a beautiful woman, which is without discretion. Okay? And if someone's not discreet, they'll say all sorts of inappropriate things, rude things. That's not what she should be saying. She, in contrast here, openeth her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. Verse 27 She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. She's not lazy. I mean, is this just, it's going over and over again, isn't it? She's not idle. Her children will rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Verse 29, many daughters have done virtuously. This is talking about someone of virtue. But thou excellest them all. Favour is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own, there's that word again, works. Praise her in the gates. So this description of this woman, this this woman, the sort of the ideal woman to marry, to sum it up, she's hard worker. That's a really important thing. She's she's kind and she's got these other characteristics. But the key thing is she's not lazy. She is she is a hard worker. And so that that is a virtue. That is a virtue that we should have. And so it's what she does that gives her virtue. What this woman does, and also what she doesn't do. There's certain things that she doesn't say. You know, she's got discretion. 
Um, Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, you can turn if you want back to 2 Peter chapter 1. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true, what sort of things are honest, what sort of things are just, what sort of things are pure, what sort of things are lovely, what sort of things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So that's saying that, you know, what we're supposed to be thinking about are things that are virtuous, things that are good, things that are right. And so what we want to do is we want to, turning back to 2 Peter 1, we want to be adding to our faith virtue. We, need to, we want to have these, um, these moral qualities. We want to be upright. You know, we want you know, the chastity or virginity you know, for someone before they're married. That's the state we should be in. These are good and admirable qualities. Our life should, should be conforming to these moral principles which we see in the Bible. Okay? Um, you're back in 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1, it says, And beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. And to, and, to, and to virtue knowledge. So we want to add to our faith virtue, and we also want to add knowledge. It says in Psalm 119, 66, it says, Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Remember how we started with faith? Add to your faith virtue, and then to virtue knowledge. It starts with faith. That's why it says, Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for or because I have believed thy commandments. Okay? And so, but remember how this, we said there's a crossover. Because we do, you need some knowledge to get saved. Okay, you, you have to know, if someone shows you the gospel, what the Bible says about being saved, that's some knowledge. You have to grasp that and understand it, so you can then choose to believe. When someone tells you Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, that he rose again three days later, that he's God in the flesh, you've got to, that's knowledge you need to have. That's why we spoke, the Bible says in Matthew 28, go ye therefore and teach all nations. We're teaching people stuff, okay? But then having said that, after getting saved, God wants our knowledge to increase. Um, Colossians chapter 1 Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 9 Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 9 Colossians 1 9 Colossians chapter 1 verse number 9 says For this cause we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding verse 10 that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Okay? God wants us, and this was Paul, was what he was praying for the Colossians, he wanted them to increase in the knowledge of God. And this is actually a common theme that you'll find in Paul's writings. He often prays for people that they would increase in their knowledge of God. It says in Philippians 1.9, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment. Okay, so because to decide whether something, to have judgment is to decide if something's right or wrong. Well, how can you decide something's right or wrong if you lack knowledge? If you're lacking knowledge, you're not going to be able to do that. And so we need to understand that Paul was praying for the Philippians, he's praying for the Colossians, that their knowledge would increase. But it's not going to happen by accident. You're not just going to find, you know, that your knowledge increases. I mean, some of you guys are studying at Varsity. Do you find that you just sort of, you know, you might maybe go and sit in the library and you just sit at a desk there and you just sit there and <coughs> sit there for an hour or two. And you don't do anything, just sitting at the desk. And then an hour or two later, you just wander off. So maybe, maybe you drink, I don't know if you're allowed to have food and drink, you're probably allowed to, maybe if it's covered coffee or something, and then you could have that. But has, does your knowledge increase just while sitting in the library? Does things just sort of soak in from the books there? Or did you actually have to do something? Mm. You know, it didn't happen by accident, did it? You know, there was actually effort that you had to do. And so the thing is, God gives us means by which our knowledge can increase. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. This is one of the means by which our knowledge can increase. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, which means like the building up, of the body of Christ, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So you say, look, that's why we've got apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. It's to build us up. 
And part of this so that we increase our knowledge, that we will come to the knowledge of the Son of God. You know, because think about someone when it says, it says, be no more children, tossed to and fro. Think about a child who's tossed to and fro. They, you tell them something and they believe this. You tell them something, they believe it. And some, some Christians are like that. So they, oh, yeah, I believe that. So they, they read something in a book. They watch something on some TV program. Or they hear it from some religious program. Oh, I believe this, I believe that. Why well, they're tossed to and fro. Because what they need to do is need to grow up in the knowledge. Okay, And that's why God has provided apostles and prophets. And it's right here. That's why he's given us um, evangelists and pastors and teachers. That's why we come to church. You know, We come to church so that we will actually increase in our knowledge. It says in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So the idea is when you come to church, I'm supposed to be preaching to you, and that's feeding you. You should be thinking, ah, okay, some of the stuff that, that you hear preached, like some of the stuff you'll hear, it's like, I've heard that before. Okay, that's good. You've read the Bible, you've heard it before, that's good. And Peter and Paul say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to, to stir you up by way of remembrance. In fact, they even talked about it in, in 2 Peter chapter 1. But also, there should be, you should be learning new things. Because as I study the Bible and read the Bible, I'm learning new things, and so I'm coming here and I'm teaching you. And it's not that it's something new that no one's ever learned before. Because if it's something brand new, then you know, you're know heading off into the realms of heresy and false doctrine. Because this, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. But what it is, as I'm learning new things, for me, then I can teach you those new things, and you can learn new things. And what that means is as you learn these new things, your knowledge increases. You know, I mean, that's why I spend hours each week preparing sermons so I can feed you with knowledge that's going to help you grow. And so when you come to church, you're being fed. Now, I mean, if you can't make it, you know, sometimes things come up and you can't make it here, I encourage you, listen to the sermons online. You know, all the sermons are uploaded to YouTube. You can go onto the YouTube channel. You know, you can subscribe to it. Every time something's uploaded, you know it's there. But just to give you a clue, two come up every Sunday and one comes up every Thursday. Pretty much that night they'll be up. I can send you the links if you ask me. But the thing about it is, is that what we need to do is, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 12, apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. So come along to church, listen to online preaching, listen and apply your heart. Try and learn, try and increase your knowledge. But, you know, you coming to listen to the preaching or even listening to sermons online, that's only part of the equation. Because not only that, you also need to be reading the Bible yourself. Okay, it's not enough that you can come to every single service we have. You can go back and you can listen to all the old sermons. You, know, you can listen to other preachers, other good preachers on the internet and listen to all their sermons. But if that's all you do, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's, actually, it's actually a dangerous thing. You, because you need to be reading the Bible yourself. Because otherwise, how are you going to know if what you hear preached is right or if it's not? If you haven't been reading in the Bible, you, you won't know. I mean, Acts chapter, have a look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse number 11. Acts 17, verse number 11, very famous verse, talks about the Bereans. It says, Acts 17, verse 11, it says, these were more noble. Doesn't that sound like some sort of virtuous characteristic? Being noble sounds like something we should be. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So that's, you should listen to what I preach Whenever you're hearing preaching, listen to it and look in the Bible to see if it doesn't match up, does it line up. And so you want to be increasing your knowledge because there's two, two big dangers you can fall into. If you don't read your Bible and yet you still listen to preaching, which you should because God says, I mean, that's why God ordained that there would be pastors and teachers. But if you listen to preaching without reading your Bible, there's two big dangers you can fall into. One thing is you could believe things that aren't right because you could be listening, and especially if you listen online, you could be listening to a preacher preach all sorts of stuff. Stuff that's wrong. But if you don't read your Bible, you just believe it. So that's one danger. But of course the other thing could be, well maybe you might hear something preached and not believe it. And think, oh he's preaching that, but I don't believe that. Doesn't sound right to me. Well, unless you check it in the Bible, it could be that he's just preaching exactly what the Bible says, but because you don't realise it. And because you don't realise it, you're then... You know, thinking something different. I mean, here's, here's a prime example. A lot of people, if someone gets saved today, you go, go and preach the gospel to someone that gets saved. There's a very common sin that people live in today is the sin of fornication. Very common. Where people live together before they're married. Very common. Well, the thing about it is, just Joe Bloggs person in the world, they're not going to know that that's wrong. 
Because there was a time, if you went back, you know, 50 years ago, when people shacked up, it was called living in sin. Okay, that's what it was called. But today, it's, who calls it that? I've never heard anyone call it that. It's normal. You know, people talk about, oh, this is my partner, this is my partner. And, and it's just normal, because on the TV, that's what everyone does. Okay? And so, the thing is, because of that's just a normal thing, someone might think that was normal, and they haven't learned. And so then when they hear someone say, hey, you shouldn't do that, and that's wrong, then they're like, well, I've never heard it before. But if they look in the Bible, they'll discover what God says about it, and we talked a little bit about this this morning, how he killed 23,000 people in one day because of it. And so we understand that it's wrong. But when people don't know, they end up with all these, um, these, all these bad results that they get otherwise. They end up with broken families. Because think about it. The whole idea of not committing fornication is you're supposed to wait. You're supposed to wait until you meet you know, the person you're going to marry. You meet you know, husband or wife, they get married, and they wait. And remember we talked before about chastity and, and, and virtue, you know, being a virgin, that sort of stuff. And so that's an important thing we should have. We should wait for that. But what happens is someone doesn't want to wait. And so they just, they, they just say, well, no, I'm just going to go and do that now. What's the end result? The end result is, well, you might be with someone for a while, and then you're off with someone else for a while, and then you're with someone else for a while. Some of the things that can come because of that, you can end up with, maybe, if you're with different people, something's quite possibly going to happen, and that is a baby could come along. Okay? Well, in that case, you end up with these broken families. It's like, you know, you have different kids from here and different kids from there. And it's, and I understand, I understand people have got different situations in their lives. Okay? And, but the fact is, it's not ideal. It's not best. I mean, you think about if you had children, would you like your children to have, well, I, well I'm living here and your mum's living there and on oh, this other, you know, and you've got your half brother and half sister and all these. Is that ideal, or would it be better to have mum, dad, and the kids, and just stay together the whole life? Wouldn't, as in, you know, until you leave home, etc. Well, the Bible says, for this cause shall man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. You know, that's the way it's supposed to be. So, some other things that people get into is because is they say, well, okay, well, we don't have these broken families. They commit abortion. So they try and fix the problem by, by, by killing a baby. And so, all these different things. But it all stems from a lack of knowledge from not knowing it in the first place. It actually says in Hosea chapter 4, Hosea chapter 4 verse 1, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy. This is talking about something that God's not pleased with. It says, The Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. So God's not pleased when his people lack knowledge. In the same chapter, verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack, for lack of knowledge. Okay? So God's people... If they lack knowledge, it can cause destruction to come into their lives. A whole pile of bad things can come into their lives. So, two minutes a second, people. Two minutes a second, Peter. I better go a bit faster because time just gets away on me sometimes. Second Peter, chapter number one. Um, so we saw we should have, um, we should be adding to our faith virtue. We should be adding knowledge. But then the third thing it says, and to knowledge temperance. To knowledge temperance. Now, temperance is probably not a word that we use a lot nowadays, but basically it's talking about if someone's, if you're temperate, it means it's sort of like talking about moderation or self-control, you know, controlling your actions, maybe controlling your words. Um, sometimes it's with relation to um, alcohol. There's, there was a thing called the temperance movement, and it's about people, you know, not drinking alcohol, that sort of general ideas. And, and, but it's control, self-control. Have a look at um, Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 28. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 28. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 28. Proverbs 25, 28 says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Someone who doesn't have any rule over their own spirit, they're like a city that is broken down and without walls. Think about a city that's lacking walls. What's going to happen to it? It's just going to be plundered. You know, there's, there's no defense. There's nothing, there's no protection. Well, it's the same thing. If someone lacks control, then there's no protection. There's, there, there's nothing going to protect them from harm. Um, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 says, And be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You see, think about, um, there's kind of like a correlation in the Bible. Actually, yeah, turn and have a look at that verse. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and verse number 18, Ephesians 5, 18, 
It says, and be not drunk with wine, ruin is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. This contrasts the Holy Spirit with wine or with alcohol. And the thing about it is, is the Holy Spirit and also alcohol will affect what you do. You know, have you ever been out somewhere and you've seen people who have been drinking? What happens when people start drinking? They start getting loud. They start getting bold. They start doing silly things. They start lacking self-control, don't they? You know, they, they act in these different ways. Now, there's some ways in which there can be a, a correlation in the sense that being filled with the Spirit, well, when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, they can be bold. But instead of being bold to do what's wrong, which is what alcohol will lead you to do, being filled with the Holy Spirit will lead you to be bold to do what's right. Okay? And so it's important that we, we, we control ourselves and we have self-control. And that's, that's one of these things that God, He desires us to have. He doesn't want us to be out of control. He doesn't want us to... I mean, some, think about what happens when you lose control. Um, maybe you get really angry about something. And so maybe some words come out of your mouth that you won't regret later. You'd say something and you think, oh, I shouldn't have said that. What happened? You lacked self-control. You got mad. Now, things like that are easier to happen if you've been drinking. You know, when people are drinking, that happens all the time. They, go, they get in fights and they're yelling and shouting at each other and smashing bottles on the ground and all this sort of stuff they do. That's the opposite of temperance. That's the opposite of self-control. God <coughs> wants us to be people who've got um, virtue, knowledge, temperance. Turn back to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number, whatever verse we are, we'll find it somewhere. Um, Verse number six. And to knowledge temperance, to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience. This is another thing that he wants us to add. To add to your faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patient. God wants us to be patient. Turn to James. You find James just before um, you've got first Peter, second Peter, and James is just before first Peter. James chapter number one. It says in First Thessalonians chapter one, verse three, it says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. And labour of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Second Thessalonians 1 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. God wants us to be patient. Over and over you'll see patience is mentioned as something that believers should be characterized by. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, very famous verse. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced them through themselves through with many sorrows. But then in contrast, verse 11, But thou, o man of God, flee these things, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Okay? So God, he wants us to be patient. He, this was Paul writing to Timothy, saying, Look, flee from the love of money. Don't go chasing money and wealth, but instead one of these things you should have is you should be patient. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. So Paul was saying to Timothy, Look, you've known how patient I was. This is, so, this is something, that, a, a characteristic. I want you to follow me in. Um, you're there in uh, James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1. Have a look at verse number 2. James chapter 1, verse 2. It says, My brethren... Count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So he's saying, look, patience is something we want to have. The trying of your faith worketh patience. It's going to lead you to be patient, but let patience have her perfect work. Patience is going to help you be more perfect, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Look at chapter 5 of James. James chapter 5 and verse number 7. James 5, 7. James 5, 7 says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Look down at verse number 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count the unhappy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job. Now, wasn't Job regarded as the most righteous man on the earth? He was patient. <coughs> These prophets, the prophets were an example. They suffered affliction, but they were patient. God desires us to be patient. That's, a, that's something we should add to our faith. We should add virtue, knowledge, temperance. We should add patience. 
It says in Hebrews 12.1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And so the Christian life is one of patience. It's going to take time to acquire these characteristics God wants us to have. I mean, and the thing is, you need patience in anything. If you want to be good at something, you know, I mean, when you're studying, do you need patience when you're studying? Do you have to apply yourself? Or do you just sit down there, everything you just get it instantly? Or do you, does it actually take, you've got to apply it, it takes some patience, okay? Um, back in 2 Peter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, <clears throat> it says, And to knowledge, temperance, and to uh, temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness. To patience, godliness. So what does it mean to, 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 be, to, to add God? I mean, how do you add godliness? What exactly is godliness? Um, 2 Peter chapter 3, have a look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 11. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 11, it says, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So when it says holy conversation, that's the way you conduct yourself. We should conduct ourselves in a way that's holy, and that is godly. Because it says in 1 Peter 1.16, it says, And be ye holy, this is what God said, be ye holy, for I am holy. So to be godly, it means to be like God. And what's God like? He's holy. You know, he's sinless. He's perfect. He does what's right. And so that's what we should be. We should be godly. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says, For kings and for all of authority, that we may, may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We should be godly. We should be honest. Okay, because being dishonest, that's being ungodly. Okay, if we're dishonest, um, the Bible says that the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. If we borrow stuff and we don't pay it back, that's being dishonest. That's ungodly. You know, um, if someone lies, they're being dishonest. That's an ungodly thing. What, is, what does it say about um, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, mm. promised before the world began. Okay, so it's important. We want to be godly. We want to be like God is. Have a look at First Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse number 3. 1 Timothy 6, 3 says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to hold some words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, doctrine which leads people to be like God, um, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. Okay, so acquiring wealth, you know, gaining stuff, that's not what godliness is. It says from such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment, that actually is great gain. Being godly, doing what's right and being content. In other words, not worrying whether you're getting great rewards for what you're doing. Because when you do what's right, sometimes you won't be rewarded straight away. Sometimes you might, you might not even be rewarded in this life when you do what's right. But when you do what's right, there is great gain in that. Because God's the one who sees. He's the one who knows. I mean, I think it talks about that in, in Matthew. It talks about how when you're supposed to pray. It says you don't go and stand on the corners of the street. You don't stand up in public and pray. It says if you do that, it says you have your reward. But it says, no, go into your closet and shut your door. It says pray to your Father which is in secret, and your Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. He's going to reward you. Okay? Um, turn back to Second Peter chapter Second Peter chapter one. So add to your faith virtue, um, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, verse seven, and to godliness brotherly kindness. I like how it says brotherly kindness. Like kindness is obviously a great virtue to have, but that reminds us we should be kind, brothers should be kind to each other. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Brothers should be kind to each other. That's a characteristic of being a brother. But that's brothers in Christ. We should be kind to one another. And this is one of the things. You see that over and over there's, there's, um, there's crossovers because God himself is kind. Didn't we read it before? It talked about in, in, um, uh, in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to... Um, oh no, sorry, I went back a verse. Um, Titus chapter 3, must be verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. So God is kind, we should be kind. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, 
forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So, in order to be kind, how can, what, how can you demonstrate that kindness? By forgiving one another. If someone does something wrong, if someone does something that might upset you, forgive them. That's being kind. Okay? We should be kind because God is kind. Have a look at um, Colossians 3.12. It says the same sort of thing. It says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So we should be kind because God is kind. Um, Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 24 says but let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these things I delight saith the Lord okay turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 you can probably guess what the next characteristic is that we're up to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 so it says and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness, charity. And to brotherly kindness, charity. This is kind of like the last thing that's on the list here. To brotherly kindness, charity. Let's have a look and see what charity is. Look in um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse number 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. You might say, well, what is this charity? Charity is talking about when you have care for one another. Now, we, we'll often use the word charity today, like think of a charity. In fact, we're actually in, this is the di diabetes room we're meeting in. That's a charity. And they, they, they're raising money for people with a particular illness and stuff like that. Okay, And you know maybe the Red Cross comes and you, I give money to charity. But the word charity, it's, I suppose it's root, it comes from the word care. It's about caring, okay? And, and it's caring that's normally displayed in action, you know? Charity is, is, is likened to love as well. So because if you love for someone, you care for them, and you look after them, okay? And so that's what we're talking about. So it's saying, you know, you could have all these, you could say these amazing things, you could have the gift of prophecy, you could have all sorts of faith, but if you don't have charity, if you don't have love, if you don't have compassion, then it says you're nothing. Look at verse number three. It says, And I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth nothing. Now let's have a look and see what charity is. Verse 4. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Doesn't that sound like what we saw before? Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. So charity's not saying, look at me, look how great I am. Instead, it's, it's thinking about others. You know, thinking about others is, is better than ourselves. Um, verse number 5. It doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easy provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity <coughs> never faileth. So charity, it never fails. It's, it's like overnight, it says you can have all of these qualities, but if, you're not, if you don't really have care, if you don't have love, if you don't have compassion, then it's, you know, that other stuff, it's, it's meaningless. You know, he says, if I have not these things, he says, I am nothing. I'm just like a, you know, a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. It's going gonna, it's gonna to profit me nothing. Charity, in fact, if you look in verse 30, it says, Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. It actually says, in, actually, um, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. You see, the Bible is a book that's got lots of commandments, isn't it? Doesn't the Bible have lots of commandments? Jesus said, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. Think of the Ten Commandments. There's many, many commandments. But First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 tells us what the point of the commandments is. It says, now the end of the commandment is charity. Out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. He's saying, that's, that's the end of the commandment. That's the end goal. It's charity out of a pure heart. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 says, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Talk about perfection, and it's that's what it is. It's having genuine care and love for another. Well, if we looked at all those all those attributes, we remember we started with faith. We had virtue and knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, kindness, charity. It's all about caring. Remember we saying earlier on, um, John 13, 34 and thirty five, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. You know that you also love one another. 
By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. That's what it's talking about. That's what we're supposed to have, you know. And so turn back to, just as we finish up, turn back to Second Peter chapter, chapter 1. Second Peter chapter number 1. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter number 1. He says here that we should be diligent. Second Peter chapter number 1. I'm on the wrong page. Second Peter chapter number 1. Verse number five, it says, and beside this, giving all diligence, and he goes through and lists, you know, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, kindness, charity. We need to give, we need to be diligent to add to our faith. Remember how we started to be saved? It's just faith. But don't be content with, you know, just, don't be just content with just being saved. Make an effort to grow and to become the sort of Christian that God actually wants you to be. God, God has a desire, the sort of Christian that he wants you to be. And the thing is, we should actually work hard at it. We should be diligent. You know, We should be diligent to add faith, add to our faith virtue. We should be diligent to add to virtue knowledge, to add to knowledge temperance, to add to temperance brotherly kindness, to add to it, you know, godliness, to add to it charity, all these different things. We should be diligent to do that. It says in um, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Throughout the Bible, we see this command, be diligent. Joshua 22, verse 5 says, But take diligent heed to do the commandment of the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And this applies, we need to understand, when it comes to diligence, which is what Peter says, notice in verse 5, it says, giving all diligence, and then look at verse number, um, uh, da, 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 verse 10, wherefore the rather brethren, give diligence to make your call and election sure. He's saying, look, he starts by saying be diligent, and at the end he says, be diligent. And so, diligence is something, this is going to apply to all areas of your life, not just spiritual things, Okay. In this, what we've been looking at here, this is talking about these spiritual characteristics, you know, virtue, you know, knowledge, temperance, godliness, self-control, things like that. But in all different areas, diligence is important. Um, actually, turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 20. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 20. Proverbs 4, 20. Not Proverbs 24, Proverbs 4 and verse 20. It says, My son, attend to my words, and climb thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Look at verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. He says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. How do we keep our hearts? The previous verse was telling us, he says, My son, attend to my words, and climb thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life those. So what he's saying is, the things that we see, the things that we hear, we should guard what comes into our eyes, because what goes into our eyes goes into our heart. What comes into our ears goes into our heart. So we need to be careful what we look at, what we listen to. We need to be diligent about it. In fact, if we keep reading through there, it says here, verse 24, put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, be careful where you go. Let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left, remove thy foot from evil. And so we see where you go, who you keep company with, that is going to affect you. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. And then he says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. Um, if we're diligent about the good and the bad influences that we allow into our lives, it's going to produce a result. It's going to have an effect. It will. If you start saying, I'm, I'm going to remove these bad influences, and I'm going to add these good influences, then over time, it's going to affect your life. You know, I mean... Being diligent in any area is going to have a result. You know, think about even like the area of finances. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4 says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. If we're slack, if we're lazy, what does the Bible say is going to happen? We're going to be poor. But then it says, But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. 
Now we know, remember we saw in, in um, uh, we didn't look at that verse, we were nearly there in First Timothy 6.10, but if you went back a little bit, it would have said, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare. We shouldn't be desiring to be rich, but the fact is, when you're diligent and work hard, you're going to prosper compared to someone who is slack and lazy. That's just a fact. That's what the Bible says. It says in Proverbs 21.5, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty, only to want. So someone that's not prepared to put the work in, someone that's just, oh, they're, in a, they're just in a hurry, well, guess what? It's going to lead them to want. Proverbs 13.4 says, the soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the diligent shall be made fat. The diligent is going to have what they, what they need. Um, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24 says, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. So it says, when you're diligent, you're going to be promoted. Someone who works hard, they're going to be promoted. I mean, I, I, I hire um, uh, lab demonstrators, and I hire them for a semester, and then I rehire some of them the next, and rehire them. And who are the ones that, I, that I'm going to rehire? The ones who work hard. The ones who turn, who turn up on time. Or better yet, they, some of them, they come early. The people who arrive early, you can rely on them. What about the person who, oh, whoop, oh sorry, I, I missed it. Sorry, whoops, oh, was I supposed to be working today? Oops, am I going to be hiring them the next semester? No. But then, if someone's working really hard, then, you know, they'll move into a position of, of authority. That's what it says. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule. They'll be in charge. So being diligent and affects all areas of our lives. It's our jobs. Our studies, I mean, be diligent. If you work hard in your studies, you're going to do better. That's just a fact. The harder you work, the better you'll do. Um, our income, we saw that before, our finances. Our health, think about being diligent. What about someone who's diligent and they diligently exercise every day? Aren't they going to be in better health than someone that doesn't? Absolutely. Um, but also diligence affects our spiritual lives. You know, Peter says that we need to be diligent to add these qualities to our life. Um, turn to, turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. See, Peter said we should be diligent to add these qualities to our life. Let's look at an example of someone who did. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. The Apostle Paul. Think about the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. This is Paul speaking. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. So Paul said we were, he was what he was because of what? The grace of God. But that's not all he said. He said, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But then look what it says. But I laboured. That means I worked. I laboured more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So you wonder, why did the Apostle Paul have such a big impact. Well, he's saying here, it's only by the grace of God. But in fact, it is by the grace of God. But don't you think that the other apostles also had the grace of God? Don't you think they had the grace of God in their lives? But Paul, but Paul seemed to achieve so much more than them. Why? I think it's because of this sentence here. But I laboured more abundantly than they all. I think Paul worked harder than the other apostles. And that's why half the New Testament is written by Paul. He was out there working like a madman. He was out there crazily working. Okay, And so that's an important thing we, are, we need to understand. God, he desires us to work hard. And when we do, we will succeed in whatever it is we do. Whatever it is we do. Ecclesiastes 19 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. He says, whatever you find to do, put every, if, every effort you can into it. Because if you do something half-hearted, at the end of the day, you're doing, say you're doing something for a period of time, at the end of the day, if you put in a big effort, there's going to be like a, a result come out of that. But if you put in a half-hearted effort, there's going to be not much results come out of that. But you've still spent the same time. You still have to do it. You know, if you're going to do something, the Bible says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Now, as I said at the start, we understand this has got nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is just by faith. By grace you save through faith, not yourselves as gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. But then it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God wants us to work. You know, the, the quality of your Christian life, it will be hugely affected by diligent working. Adding to your faith. It's great to have faith. It's great to be saved. 
<laughs> but don't stop there. Become a better husband, a better wife, a better child, a better employee, a better student, you know. But most importantly, a better, a better Christian, a better servant of God. And you can become a better Christian by being more diligent. You know, whatsoever the hand findeth to do, it says in Colossians 3.23, whatsoever, sorry, um, Colossians 3.23 says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Turn back to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll just finish off. 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter number 1, 2 Peter chapter number 1, and verse number 5, 2 Peter chapter 1. And just think about these things. Think about adding these and think about what, what area do you need to add something in your life. Second Peter chapter number 1, verse number 5, it says, And beside this, giving all diligence. He says, giving all. didn't say giving some diligence. He says, giving all diligence. Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness and a brotherly kindness charity for if these things be in you and abound that means if they're in you and there's a lot of them they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ in other words the knowledge that you had being saved you won't be barren or unfruitful you'll bear fruit one great way of bearing fruit is you'll see souls get saved wouldn't you love to preach the gospel to someone and see them get saved that's bearing fruit and that's what Jesus, he, he desires us to do that. But it says, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And it's forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He says, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. See, whether you do these things, add these things to your life, you're still saved. You'll still be in the kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. But will you have an abundant entrance that it talks about here? Remember how some people, are, it's like they're saved by the skin of their teeth, it says they're saved so is by fire. But the fact is, God wants to reward us. And he says he'll reward us according to our works. So that's, that's my encouragement, is we want to we wanna add to you. It's great that you've got faith. It's great that you're saved. But add to that faith and be diligent about it let's pray gracious Lord we thank you for your word and help each one of us Lord I'm preaching this as much for myself as for anyone here I need to be more diligent I need to be more diligent in all areas of my life help each one of us to grow Lord help us to add these things help us to add these characteristics to our life help us to find to seek you and your word to, to grow you know, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Help us to turn to you. Help us to seek you in prayer, Lord. Ask and it shall be given you, your word says. Lord, please help us. I pray that you would make us a church that is characterised by diligence. Characterised by faith. Characterised by charity. All these characteristics, Lord. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.